Ross Stevenson wants to give you a recommendation. Hear it on his new podcast, Ross Recommends. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Mercedes-Benz Berwick for sponsoring Ross Recommends. Nine Podcasts. Hello, this is Neil Mitchell. Well, it's time to sit down and have a chat to a well-known Australian and ask a basic question. What makes you what you are? What drives you? Why are you what you are? Or as I like to put it, what makes you tick? Every Tuesday, what makes you tick? We talk to people, let's have a look at what's behind them, what's made them what they are. Talk to people like Margaret Court, Jason Akamanis, Jared Harvey... Madeline West, Sam Newman, Todd Woodbridge. Spoke to the Yellow Wiggle last week, Greg Page. This week, one of the greatest defenders to play Aussie football. Won a premiership with Richmond, best and fairest, five all Australians. Left the game early to concentrate on his faith and, and religion. He's an entrepreneur, written kids' books, found his own education program for year 11 and 12. Alex Rance, good morning. Good morning, thanks for having me on. Can you sing and dance? Not well. I was at a wedding on uh, on Thursday, actually, and yeah, I think that really proved how poor of a dancer that I am. But you didn't. I read you went to a music and arts school from kinder to about year ten. Why? Yeah, uh, more more from the sort of non-denominational side of things. That was one of the schools that was up in the hills in in Western Australia called Helena College, and the sport wasn't necessarily number one priority there. But it was yeah, it certainly developed other areas of my my personality and other areas of my skill set, which I think held me in good stead for later in life. Well, that doesn't include singing and dancing, though. <laughs> no, no, definitely not, no. <laughs> but you weren't, you weren't greatly into footy when you were growing up, were you? Until you were about 12? Yeah, it didn't start until I was 12, which is, I guess, interesting because my old man, he, he played. He captained West Coast and uh, played for the Bulldogs and had the footy pedigree, but yeah, I just played a lot of other things. I did triathlons, played golf, played volleyball, just loved sort of exploring, loved nature, camping, things like that. I was never a footy head, and I still am not really a big footy head. It's just been a, a different journey to the AFL for me. And why do you think that is? Why did you Why did you not, even as a child, you weren't right into footy? Why not? Oh, I don't know. I think it just all comes comes around to... I guess what you value, I valued spending time with my family. And so it didn't really matter what I was doing. That was whether I was kicking the footy with my dad or whether I was herding the sheep or, or doing something like that. Like it didn't really matter what I was doing as long as I was with good people and I was felt like it was it was a wholesome activity. So some people find that deep connection with, with football and with sport because they, they have that deep connection with their family members and things like that. I just had a lot of different opportunities to connect with my family. It's an unusually mature thing for a child to think, though. You know, I just want to be with my family. That sounds like the executive who's just got sacked from his job and wants to spend more time with his family. It's a very mature thing that you were doing at that age. Well, I think it all boils down to that as a, as a person. Like, yeah, when you're a kid, you know no better. Whether you're chopping wood or kicking the footy, it doesn't matter because you're with, your, family, you're with your, your mum or your dad. You don't discriminate as a kid on the task. All you know is, I'm, I'm here with my my family so yeah i don't think it's necessarily a choice it's just more brand association for lack of a better word that you know this is what i do that that makes me and my dad connect or me and my mum connect or me and my brother connect or whatever it is i've known a few jehovah's witnesses over the years as friends and most of them came from families of jehovah's witnesses your family is that where you had the influence to become a witness yeah so my mum and dad weren't um, when they were growing up and they they started studying the Bible and, and found that Jehovah's Witnesses were the, the ones that were giving them the greatest support and, and helped them to, to study the Bible. And then so, yeah, from early years, I was going to church meetings and looking at the Bible and things like that. But it sort of never was really a, a big priority in my life at that stage. It was more like a hobby, just something that we did as a family. But it wasn't until sort of later in life that I looked at it more seriously and I, and I found that it was... It was not just a hobby, it was just not something to do on a Sunday. It's a way of life and, and, and started to sort of apply that in a much more deeper sense. But yeah, it's it's something that I guess people take to at a different age uh, once they come to an accurate knowledge. Was it a slow process or did you feel that you were called? Was there a moment that you said, yep, this is what I am, this is me? I think it's a slow process that 
Um, it's not going to be like a, a lightning bolt moment. There's always going to be penny drop moments, but it's more about application. I think the reality is in life, there's a lot of things that we know are good for us, you know, and no, we shouldn't smoke, no, we shouldn't speed, no, we shouldn't cut corners in some area of our work, but it's whether or not we have enough conviction to actually not do it. And so, you know, for so long, I, I had this strong feeling and, and knowledge that there's something bigger out there that we have to have been created. What happens to us when we die? All those types of questions. But I didn't, because it was a hobby, it was just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a good question. And I'll just leave it there and I'll, I'll carry on with my life. So I didn't dig too much deeper into it until sort of the last, you know, five, ten years. So... Mm. Well, you, you you started footy at 12, but came to Richmond as an 18-year-old. Would, would, were you committed to the church at that stage? No. So I I sort of stopped going uh, when I was, yeah, about 17. I just had other things were, took my priority. And, yeah, I just was sort of caught the footy bug and, and, yeah, found that that was a way that I could get sort of validation in the world. And, yeah, so it was it was from sort of 17 to maybe 22 or 3 that I sort of was doing my own thing and not really doing a lot from a spiritual perspective. And then after that, I sort of started thinking about it a lot more and started to make sort of inroads back. Did that clash with your football or your football culture at any stage? In some ways it didn't, in some ways it didn't. So off-field, it, it massively supported it because so much about being a good spiritual person and so much of what the Bible teaches is about love and support and connection and, and unity and, and peace and things like that. So that's great for culture and connection off field, but then you contrast that with the person that you need to be on field to be successful, which is competitive, dominant, physical, you know, it sort of flies in the face of it. So it's, it, it is exhausting to try and switch that person on and off. And, and I felt quite exhausted and, and quite conflicted at times on, you know, what person I really wanted to be known for is do I want to be known as this sort of like physical dominant defender that makes people like, you know, I've got to shut someone down to do my job or do I want to be known as this sort of connector cultural person and, and, and helping people. So it was a challenge, but that's sort of what's ultimately led for me to, to finish my career early was that I just, I wanted to, to do more on the peaceful, loving, caring, supportive side of things rather than the sort of competitive and dominant side of things. Did you, I read that you, you really disliked game day for that reason. Is that true? Because you, you, you played over 200 games, you didn't like it? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't at all. Yeah, it was something that I felt I had to do just to sort of... Yeah, because I'd, I'd always feel guilt. Like I said before, I'd feel torn. I, was, I felt guilty if I was overly physical, overly competitive at the end. Like, you know, I might have had a good game, but it still was just like, well, I don't really like the way that I had to treat that person to get there. And it was hard for me sometimes to sort of bridle my competitiveness because I I did want to win and I did want to be successful, but sometimes it was at what cost. Alex, we're talking to Alex Rance, one of the great defenders, five-time All-Australian. I remember reading Tony Lockett, one of the, one of the greatest full forwards, used to throw up before every game he was so nervous. Have you ever been through that time? Yeah, I've, I've thrown up a few times. Um, but I started to get, uh, towards the back end of my career, we did some really amazing work with Emma Murray, uh, which oh, yeah. talked about focus and mindfulness and, um, and controlling our thoughts and, and emotions. Because, you know, if you play in an emotional state, it's, it's going to be boom or bust. Whereas if you play in a more process-based thought pattern, then you're going to be far more successful and consistent. So that stopped when I started to get more focused and, and mindful of, of the process rather than focusing on how I'm feeling and if I get 10 kicked on me or if I don't or if I play well or things like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that sort of put an end to that. been reading uh, the book Tom Boyd's just released about the struggle that went on with him, a struggle with mental health issues, uh, which thankfully he seems to be uh, dealing with. But you, you've had a similar struggle in a sense. If every game day for so many years you've had this internal battle to go out and be behave like a competitive AFL footballer, how did you cope with that? What did it do to your life? Yeah, it wasn't an internal conflict, but I, like, I guess I, I was very fortunate that I had really great people around me that and, and I'm I feel like I'm quite an introspective person and I'm quite a I'm a talker so I, I could talk my way through it with good people that were around me and I sort of had different ways of validation to, to make sure that I knew that I was 
you know, still a good person, still a good brother, still a good family member, still a good teammate. It's also about just focusing on the good things mm-hmm. rather than focusing on the things that you need to fix and the things that aren't going well. So it can be a challenge, and I've got no doubt, especially at a young age, you know, young AFL players get picked up at 18 years of age and they don't know how to fully control all those thoughts and don't have a, a really complete idea of the person that they want to be, and so it's being formed on the fly. So it can be a challenge, and I've got no doubt that it's going to have some pretty significant uh, mental health issues going forward um, if it's not well supported. And I know a lot of clubs are very much on the front foot in terms of supporting that sort of mindfulness, focus, process-driven um, mentality, and a lot of the successful clubs are reaping the benefits of that. Did you enjoy the Premiership? What was the conflict there within? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it was more relief than anything. I think if you talk to anyone who's won a flag... Yeah. The, the first feeling is just like relief. But then the, the, it doesn't take long before, and because this is a continual cycle and it's sort of the, the rat race of life, I guess, in general, is as soon as you make, as soon as you conquer one mountain, there's another one just pops up straight in front of you. So it's like, can we do it again? So you don't really have long to sort of enjoy the success. But yeah, definitely it was it was nice reward for effort and it was nice to now have a tangible thing which connects that the group that we can always come back and say hey remember that year or remember that period of time and that was part of the reason why I wrote the children's books that I did was to almost be a bit of a time capsule to sort of come back to to say that was a, that was a cool moment that was a cool time Alex, I'm sure you're aware of, um, and I've read that you said the, the player who's, who uh, sledged you the most was Steve Johnson. Stevie J sledged everyone. Never shut up, I'm told. But I'm sure you're aware of what happened at the weekend where um, a young Melbourne player was left in tears by sledging from the Brisbane captain. Is football that cruel? Does it have to be that cruel? I never thought it, it needed to be. I'm not sure whether it was because I... Um I was a defender and, you know, any time you get lippy, it's, it, it always comes back in your face anyway. But I look at some of the best players that I ever played against, Buddy Franklin and, and Josh Kennedy for West Coast. I don't think I ever got in any sort of lippy verbal stashes with them. It was never disrespectful in any way. I didn't really agree with the mind games that verbally needs to happen. Some people do, and, you know, that's their, that's their, their way. But I felt like I just wanted to beat them on their merits rather than sort of trying to... Did, they, their head, so. did, did anybody ever target you on the basis of your religious beliefs? Because they are unusual in football. Did anybody ever go at you for that? Nah, nah. I think well, for, for probably two reasons. That I, I wasn't really that you know vocal about it and not many people would have, would have known about it too much. The world has changed a lot in the last sort of five years of, of what is and isn't acceptable to even go close to talking about. And so I don't think anyone would probably go... Uh, and and have a have a have a niggle from that perspective, mm. but it, it it just shows now how fine the line is that it, I I think it's, there's probably no place for it really because it's just it's such a minefield. You must have been a confident young man. You turned up at 18. You shouted at Matthew Richardson on your first day, and you end up in a push and shove with Jack Rewald a couple of times. Didn't didn't you get on with Jack? Uh, oh, we were just we're very similar people, Jack and I. That we sort of were like siblings that we both had very strong opinions we both weren't afraid to voice our opinions and so that led to a couple of instances where we got a little bit heated but that was that was also part of the sort of competitive side of things wasn't as bad as the melbourne players in a restaurant in paran was it no no it wasn't wasn't that bad but <laughs> but you were self-confident you give poor old richard you give him a spray when you're 18 yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> not one of my not one of my prouder moments, but uh, yeah, there was. It, it's funny when you're a young kid, and and this this goes to the sort of piece of being 18 and what coming into a professional environment. You have this this perspective of what you think a leader is or what professionalism is, but you don't really know. And I just had sort of this probably misguided perspective of of what leadership looked like, and I was I was trying to just you know drive standards and, and things like that, but it was um. Yeah, I just probably needed to learn a bit before I spoke. How did Richo take it? Because you're a very oh, gentle like, man in his own way, isn't he? Like the the humble gentleman that he is, he just just took it in his stride and didn't really fight back. And <laughs> yeah, he was he was amazing. It was probably the best example to me of, of what a good leader is. That he it said more that he didn't need to say anything than if he had a sort of bitten back and, and put me in my place. 
Dustin Martin intrigues me, arguably one of the best players I've ever seen, and I've watched footy for a long time. He's beautiful to watch, but obviously a very complex person. And it shows, as you said, how far we've come that he's able to take time off for mental health leave and only be treated well for when he has to do that. But what sort of character is he? What, what, how did you find him? Obviously, because of the fame that he has earned, he is a, a quite a private person, and but he was a phenomenal teammate. Uh, I, I loved every minute of, of time that I spent with Dusty. He was always quite pretty quiet. and But, yeah, he always loved to be around a joke, never, la- never liked to be the centre of a joke, but loved to be around a joke. Yeah, I don't ever think I had a, a, a negative experience with Dusty, uh, and then he just he just switched it on on game day. Like he was probably a, a, the opposite to me, where he really thrived on game day and loved game day, and that was his free space mm. where he could sort of express himself. Whereas I was probably more the off field expression, uh, where he probably just he liked to sort of do his bit, and then with his his way of leading was on field. He complemented the, the leadership group in a in a really different way. I think you'll play on. I hope so. I think everyone hopes so. Um, yeah, I agree. He's, he's a phenom, so I think he's still got plenty of good footy left in him. He's been through a lot, like, and, and this is like I haven't been in in constant communication with him, but yeah, he's been through a lot in the last well, in the last year, especially we all have. But yeah, to go from you know all the things that he's accomplished, and he puts a lot of work in as well. Like he's not, he doesn't just rock up and it all happens. Like he puts in a lot of work. So yeah, he's probably well entitled to have a little bit of. Uh, a break and, and reset yeah. himself, and I'm, I'm sure he, he, if he wanted to, he could come back and play some amazing footy. Tell me about your academy, because this seems to be your future. What, what, what is it? How does it work? So, yeah, we've got three campuses in Essendon, Geelong, and Wangaratta, uh, and basically it's uh, for year 11 and 12 boys at this stage, but we're looking to potentially branch out into girls as well. The reason why we started it was we wanted to create... Uh, passion-based education where the teachers, the students, the curriculum and the campus is all based around the students' passions. In this circumstance, we're starting with AFL because that's the industry I know. So we've got teachers that love AFL and then all students that love AFL and are are passionately engaged towards moving towards that that, um, sort of passion field. So whether it's a, a you know, potentially a groundskeeper at an oval or a player or a statistician, so whatever it might be, it's about passionately engaging students in their education. So, yeah, we've got a lot of students uh, going through those three campuses now. And, um, yeah, we've got some experience days coming up in Essendon, Wangaratta and, and Geelong. Uh, so, yeah, you can jump on, on the website, theacademy.com.au, to book your spot if, if that's something um, that you might be interested. Because the last two years, I think, have been really challenging for, for families from an educational perspective, especially in Victoria with homeschooling and things like that. So... Now is a really good time to think about how okay. can your son maximise the last two years of his education to really engage him in what he's doing and give him some meaningful outcomes to uh, what's going to happen after school. OK, well, look good on you. And one of the most character-forming experiences I can imagine is knocking on the door as a Jehovah's Witness to people who probably don't want to see you. How did you handle that? Yeah, well, obviously it hasn't been hasn't been done for the last few years because of COVID and things like that, mm. but, you know, writing letters and... And doing some uh, phone calls and things like that have been a part of just helping people to um, find a little bit of stability in a, in a pretty unstable world. So um, I feel like it, it is quite a... No, nobody really, I think, enjoys public speaking, but when you're passionate about what you are talking about and when you believe that it's really going to benefit other people, you put that emotion aside and you really um, can... can yeah. But what, what, response, what response did you get, though? People would, would answer the door and they found you there. They'd recognise you. I assume they'd want to engage, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, it's, I've had a few interesting conversations and, and um, yeah, they're, they're not always spiritually <laughs> based. Um, but <laughs> at, at the end of the day, like, it's about connection. Where, you know, the world you know, has never been more in inverted commas connected with social media and the internet and all that kind of stuff, but in so many ways has never been more disconnected that we, we can't talk about and articulate uh, emotions and feelings and, and it's such a taboo subject to talk about our beliefs and, um, you know, ask deeper questions and actually reason on the Bible as a, as a source of, of, of evidence to, to prove whether we believe things or don't believe things. So, um, 
yeah, I, I just hope that more people can be open to it and um, to, to have a bit more of a discussion. I've had some fantastic discussions with some teammates that have different religious beliefs. And, and you know, we, we have open discussions on what we believe is um, the truth and what we believe is, is um, you know, going to happen in the future and things like that. Great to speak to you. All the best with the Academy. And uh, that's online to check out. Thank you very much for your time and good luck with it. Thank you for talking to us. No worries. Thank you.